Hello, Pastor Pounds. Hi. Um, good afternoon. So I just have a few questions for you. Sure. Uh, could you tell me about uh, stuff of your faith? Or like, did your family grow up as evangelicals or did you convert or how did it happen? Yeah, so I actually grew up, um, I grew up in a Christian family. Uh, my dad was the pastor of a Baptist church for my whole life. Uh, he served at the same church for over 35 years, the church in Mansfield, Ohio. Um, so I grew up in a family that was evangelical in its beliefs, and I accepted Christ. Um, I committed my life to Him when I was fairly young. Uh, and that was something that I kind of renewed and took ownership as, of as I got older. Uh, specifically, I would say it was when I entered into uh, junior high, so 7th and 8th grade, when I really had a sense that um, I wanted to make that a personal commitment. Um, it was wasn't just something I was born into, but that was the point where I began to have a, a faith of my own, where I started to develop my own beliefs and to think critically about what I believed. Um, so I don't know, you're looking for, I guess I'll just continue the story for a little bit. So then uh, after that, uh, I in junior high, following junior high, I when I was in our senior high youth group, I then served as a leader with the junior high students. Um, I really enjoyed that. I found that to be very fun and stimulating. Uh, I just enjoyed the opportunity to pass on things that I had learned as well. Um, I went to college in Minnesota at Bethel University. Um, I was a communication studies major and about my junior year I, um, I would say I received a call to full-time ministry so I sensed that that was where God was leading me. Um, so I went to seminary after that, I was at seminary for about five or six years. Um, I did their 7 p.m. program while I worked full time. And upon graduation, I was hired here at uh, First Evangelical Free to be the associate pastor. All right, nice story. Uh, so do you know how evangelicalism began? Or like how did it get its name as a different denomination of Christianity? Sure, so I guess... Uh, Evangelicalism is maybe better understood as a movement than a denomination. Um, in fact, specifically, uh, some leaders, I'm not real clear on the timeline, I uh, apologize for that, but I'd say roughly 100 years ago, maybe a little less than that, um, began a movement where they were, what they were trying to do was they were trying to build a way to find common ground across denominations, so to bridge some of the divides between different denominations. Uh, just for example, I grew up in what is what was then the Baptist General Conference. It's now called Converge Worldwide. Uh, I minister now at an EFCA church. Um, the difference between those two churches theologically is minimal, if anything. Uh, and there's a number of denominations where the differences would be very small. Uh, so evangelicalism was a movement uh, whereby they, they hoped that they could gather together leaders of different denominations and say, Listen, we know we've got differences on some theological issues, uh, but can we agree that those are more uh, second-order concerns or lesser concerns? And on the main things, what we would call as the ESCA, the essentials, uh, can we agree that we have unity around those things? Um, and so, as they sort of they sort of built a consensus around that. And so, what is now known as evangelicalism is really sort of a a movement that incorporates a number of denominations. Uh, it's not just a one denomination type thing. So it's it's a means by which um, now people in my denomination, the EFCA, might say, uh, yes, you are maybe Methodist or Baptist, but, but we would know that if we both identified as evangelicals, that while we have some differences, that we would agree on the core things. So it's like a whole group of denomination type things that's correct yeah so it's it's you probably you shouldn't understand that as a denomination there is no denomination of all evangelicals uh, but it's it's really it's an identity it's an identity that helps us uh, recognize where there's some common ground uh, around the most significant theological issues and you think there is like any uh, significant uh, dates or like um, events in the history of this movement of evangelicalism yeah, again, you know, sorry, I'm not going to have a lot of specific dates for you, but what I, what I can tell you is I think probably one of the most significant uh, formative parts of evangelicalism is, um, would probably relate to Billy Graham, who recently passed away. So evangelicalism, uh, I would say, uh, was in part, became popular and was driven by the success of Billy Graham and his crusade ministry. 
Um, but it, it also made that possible. Um, that type of ministry with, with wide support from local churches was only possible because there was this bigger umbrella label called evangelicalism uh, so that when Billy Graham could come to town, he could say, listen, I'm doing this crusade, I'd like support and I'd like follow up um, from all the churches locally. Uh, and, and so Billy Graham's concern wasn't that all the churches would agree on every single point of doctrine, but that on the most critical points, uh, specifically surrounding um, what they would say the gospel is and how we as human beings are called to respond to the gospel, uh, so that really allowed for his ministry to work because he could come into a town and he would get cooperation across many denominations in a way that really before that and before this notion of evangelicalism existed uh, wasn't really possible. Um, just as a quick anecdotal story, um, one of the fun things about being a pastor is you get to know the, the people in your congregation and we've got a number of, of seniors in our congregation who are in their 70s, 80s, and they will tell you uh, that when they were younger and when they started dating their now spouse of you know 60 70 years that in some cases their parents were very upset because they were they grew up you know lutheran and their spouse grew up methodist and they just you know the parents were concerned that that was that was terrible and that things were going to end badly uh, but of course what those young people found out on their own is that yes there of course were differences of opinion and doctrine uh, but their core beliefs uh, were very compatible um, and so that uh, it's sort of that what happened on a much larger scale with evangelicalism. So I would say if you want sort of a, um, an event or something that really captures um, what that's about, uh, Billy Graham's ministry is really um, something that both made it possible, or something that both made it more popular as well as something that was made possible because of evangelicalism. And so going off of like different opinions or beliefs, what yeah. would um, evangelicals believe that are like different than other denominations of Christianity? Um, so part of what makes evangelicalism uh, evangelicalism, uh, the, the word actually comes from the Greek word uh, euangelion, uh, which means simply good news. Uh, we often translate it gospel. So as the name then suggests, for, for evangelicals, the gospel... Mm -hmm. Um, is central to their identity, their understanding of who they are and what the church is and what the church should be doing. Uh, so in particular, one of the big um, emphases of evangelicalism, and again, this points to the whole Billy Graham ministry, um, is that there is a sense of the importance of sharing the gospel with others. Um, that's a high priority. Um, as well as there's, there's a, a real focus on the personal um, response to the gospel. So one thing that you'll find across all groups that would identify themselves as evangelical uh, is a sense that um, the gospel is the story of what God has done for us in and through the person of Jesus Christ, but that we have a responsibility to respond to that and to respond to that with faith uh, and allegiance to Jesus Christ as our, as our king in a very literal type sense. Um, so that those I'd say are some of the, the key distinctives of evangelicalism. And so what would you say are like some of the main similarities between like Catholic, Lutheran, or evangelical? Um, so you're looking for like uh, similarities and differences? Uh, well, different, mainly just similarities here. Sure. Um, you know, I would say, I would say that there are, there are broad similarities. I think part of what Part of where there may still be some difference might be might revolve more around the role of the church specifically, mm -hmm. um, but I, the Lutherans and Catholics that I know, um, the vast majority of them uh, would articulate the gospel in a way very similar to how I would articulate the gospel. They also, um, well, you could go back to uh, to the creeds, the various creeds of the early church. Um, and so I would say in a long list of those essentials about who God is, about what he's done in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, about specifically how we're to respond as individuals um, in faith and allegiance uh, to Jesus, um, there's similarity across all of those. So I, I, in my personal opinion, there's a great deal of common ground. Uh, in fact, the overlap, I would say, is, makes up the vast majority of belief on both sides. So you'd say like there's a... The similarities are more big or broad than the differences, which are more like smaller or detailed. 
In my estimation, yeah, the, the similarities are, are much larger. It makes them a much larger category than the differences, yes. Okay. Yep. So what would you say is like the best part of being evangelical or rather than, like I said, Catholic or Lutheran or different denomination? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a good question. It's a tough question, too. I, I think, and again, this reflects uh, my belief as a Protestant, probably, mm -hmm. but I think one of, one of the nice things about the different denominations is that it accounts for the fact that people are different. Um, people are going to feel comfortable worshiping in different ways. Um, and, and one of the advantages, I would say, of Protestantism is that there is sort of a, a greater freedom of, of expression uh, in terms of worship, um, you know, there you can, depending on where you go in Protestant churches, you can encounter vastly different types of, of music. Um, some churches on Sundays are going to be predominantly organs and pianos, uh, to you can go to the other end of the spectrum where you're going to have, you know, crazy light laser shows and electric guitars and, and things like that. Um, and I think what's interesting is, uh, you have Protestants all across the spectrum who would point at some of those and say, you know what, I, would, I, couldn't, I couldn't possibly handle that. But I'm happy that people are able to worship that way and have the opportunity to worship that way. So it's, it's nice, I think, to have that. It's also, I would say, one advantage of Protestantism is, and it's, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse, um, as the history of Protestantism will show, um, there is the potential for opinions to keep diverging and diverging and for more and more splits to happen uh, and I don't particularly like that part but I do think that there it it allows for better correction along the way uh, in that it's harder for the whole movement to be hijacked uh, by somebody that either has a, a what I would say is a bad agenda or ulterior motives um, and that that realistically um, if you get one group moving to the extreme you maybe have another group moving the other way and I think it creates some balance for the whole mass. I don't know if that makes great sense or not, but at least in my mind, I kind of like the notion that because there aren't strict controls from on, on high, uh, it's more difficult for the whole project, I guess, um, to get off the rails. So, yeah. Yeah, and you said, so, the most challenging part, or like, a challenging part would be opinion, different opinions, like, diverging. Yes. Like, and so what, are, what do you think are some other challenges that would come about being evangelical? Yeah, so some challenges for sure revolve around um, just differences of opinion and doctrine, differences of opinion on interpretation. Uh, Protestantism very, very quickly um, found itself in a difficult situation specifically around biblical interpretation. So um, going all the way back to Martin Luther and his four solas, uh, one of them is sola scriptura. And so one of the ways that Protestantism saw itself as setting itself apart from Roman Catholicism uh, was in saying that it is the Bible and the Bible alone that is vested with the highest level of authority, uh, even above um, church practice and, ch and church history and tradition. Um, however, of course, once you go down that road, you realize that... Um, oh, sorry, I'm going to nerd out on communication theory for you for a minute... Uh, we, can, we can't, as human beings, directly transfer meaning. Um, we always have to encode it in symbols, which we usually call words. Uh, and then we can transmit those symbols, but they have to be decoded on the other end. Uh, and so you can never be quite sure, except by continuing the conversation, whether or not the person you're, you're speaking with understands exactly what you intended them to understand or not. Biblically, what that means is that while we believe the Bible is the, the ultimate authority uh, in one sense, we also should recognize, we should, that it's ultimately our interpretations of that Bible that we're giving authority. Um, again, I think there's protection in doing the interpretation in community, uh, but it also becomes difficult because people on their own can, be, can become convinced that their interpretation is not only correct, but maybe it's the only correct interpretation. Uh, and if you don't have a sort of a, a clear hierarchy or a respect for authority or at least expertise, it becomes difficult to sort of protect orthodoxy. Uh, it becomes difficult to refute people who are interpreting wrongly or just poorly. Um, and in fact, if you look around um, today, I would argue that there are lots of examples 
uh, where just sort of the street level theology is actually very poor. It's based on a poor understanding of scripture. And that's difficult to correct uh, because while we want to tell people they have access to that freely on their own, uh, the reality is uh, it does take some work to rightly interpret scripture. Um, and so that's one area where I'm a little jealous if you're in a more hierarchical denomination, uh, Catholic, Lutheran, uh, or you know, Anglican church as well, um, where there are usually the people with the expertise are also given the authority. And so they can deliver an authoritative interpretation. Always the chance that that's wrong as well. Um, but it makes it much easier to correct people uh, who, who start... Um, who aren't interpreting well, who aren't thinking well about theology. All right, so then going off on a little different path, uh, how did you know you wanted to become an associate pastor, pastor or like pursue your faith? Sure, so that's a little bit of a, of a more difficult question. Um, in part, it was very personal for me, and I would say, you know, sometimes because it's, it's, it's ministry, we, we, we want to make it a little more mystical. Uh, you know, but honestly, just in my experience of talking to other people, um, I would say I sort of discovered that I wanted to be in ministry the same way um, that a lot of people discover that they want to be architects or that they want to be engineers or that they want to be in design. Um, I, I felt what I would articulate as a call to that, um, but it's a call in a vocational sense. I really had the sense that God had called me and equipped me, prepared me, uh, and, but that he also gifted me, that I was good at teaching, um, and that I enjoyed doing that, um, that I enjoyed helping other people come to a, a deeper and better understanding of who God is and, and how he had revealed himself in his word. Um, so that's kind of how I, I got started down that track. Um, as to how I ended up in my current job, that's kind of an interesting story too. Uh, I started attending this church in college when I was dating my wife. She grew up here. Actually, her parents grew up here as well. Um, and it just sort of worked out well that when I graduated from seminary, they were looking to hire an associate pastor. Um, and I applied and was hired. And I, I like, I love my job. I love the position, the job description. I get to preach periodically on Sunday mornings, probably about once every five weeks or so. I also teach on a regular basis. And my real passion uh, is for teaching. I, I really enjoy both the studying part for me where I'm continually learning uh, and also the opportunity to try to extend that understanding to others. And so you said um, the calling to be a pastor is like a call from Christ, maybe? Do you have any other like calls from Christ, kind of, or times where you felt close to him? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, just to be clear, I'm using call in a sort of a metaphorical way. I didn't hear like an audible voice or anything. Um, but yes, I, I do... Have what I would describe as a relationship with Christ um, where I'm seeking through prayer uh, to communicate with him and again uh, prayer obviously is a little bit different but in another sense it's not all that diff different from um, communicating with other people that you're in a relationship with friends you have uh, where again the only way that people can know us is if we share who we are um, and so that's partly what I'm trying to do in prayer um, and also just through regular reading of scripture, um, that is, we call it uh, God's word, we also call it revelation, excuse me, and most properly that's what it is, it's, it's God's means of revealing himself to us. So when I'm reading the Bible, what I'm trying to do, uh, in, the same, in the same way that you would, would read a biography, or a similar way I guess, uh, or even letters from a friend, as I'm trying to get a sense of who God is, uh, to get to know him better, uh, but to do that specifically through uh, the book that he gave us for that purpose. All right, so building off that, you, you might not like, have an answer for this, but yeah. is there any, um, has there ever been a time where you've like, felt, the struggle, felt the struggle to believe in God? Um, you know, not really. I mean, I would say I certainly have doubts, I have questions. Um, there are all sorts of times that um, I mean, there are, well, okay, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick story here, too. Um, a few years ago, my youngest brother, I'm, I'm the oldest of three, uh, was diagnosed with cancer uh, in his 20s. It just hit us out of nowhere. Um, 
he had had a, a climbing accident and had a lot of back pain. We thought it was related to that. Uh, but when he went in finally to get a scan because it wouldn't go away, they found out he had stage four cancer. Um, it was un unidentified type. Um, and he died just a little over a year after that. And there was a lot of a lot of struggle just within that, coming to terms with that. Um, times when I said, when I was praying for him to be healed, uh, that I would say to God, God, I don't understand how it could be bad for this young person who loves you to be healed of this terrible disease. So there was a struggle in that sense, but I never questioned that he existed or even questioned that he was good and wise. Um, you know, ultimately, even in those moments where I desperately wanted him to heal my brother, I also knew at the same time that I, what I believe about him is that he is wiser than me, that he knows more than me, that his purposes are better than mine. Um, and so even, even though in the moment and in, in, in things where I'm intimately acquainted, I, I maybe would desperately want God to do something different than what he does. When I'm able to take a step back from that, I would tell you that even in cases like that, what I want most is for God's will to be done. Uh, to be a Christian is to believe that his will is what's best for all of us. Um, sometimes that's very hard, and it doesn't mean we have to be happy about that or rejoice in that. I certainly didn't. I mourned and grieved his loss. I still miss him. Um, but... Even in the midst of that, I found that I did actually believe what I thought I'd believed, which is that God is wiser than me, that he has to know better. Um, so maybe that's I don't know, a good example of, of something like that. Yeah. yeah. What do you find meaningful or like sacred about your faith? Yeah, so I think maybe fundamentally um, one of the things that's significant for me is that um, I get my, my primary, my core identity of who I am from my faith. Um, you know, identity, I would argue, is, is something we construct for ourselves. Um, you know, there, there are certain facts about who we are that we can't change, um, but in a, in a way, our identity is the story we tell about who we are. Um, and so one of the things that my faith provides for me uh, is, is it, it tells a story of which I'm a part. Um, and so... I would, I would tell you that before, I, before I'm before i an American, uh, before I'm a father or a husband, uh, even before I would identify as a male, uh, that, that above all of those things, uh, first and foremost, uh, is that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, I'm a child of God. And so it informs my identity that way. It gives me an identity that otherwise I would not have. Um, and it also provides direction in how to live out that identity so that if it's one thing to believe that about yourself, that that's who you are, it's another thing altogether to figure out, okay, how now should I live then uh, if, if this is who I am? Um, and so uh, my faith provides that, provides the foundation for my identity as who I am. Um, it also, I think, provides purpose for me in the sense that um, you know, the Bible really tells the story of uh, God's partnership with humanity uh, from the very beginning all the way through to the very be very end, that God's desire is that human beings would be partners with him in his work in creation. Uh, and so that gives me not only an identity, uh, but it gives me purpose as well, that I am, I am a partner in what God is doing. Um, so to me, that's something that's very significant. Uh, that is also something, however, like the identity piece, that requires sacrifice as well. Uh, recognition that if I'm really going to believe that's who I am and what that's what I've called to, been called to do, that I've got to put aside some some things that I might prefer to pursue or to run after. Uh, and so I, I willingly choose to set aside my some of my dreams and purposes and plans in order to pursue God's. Uh, and, and the best way that I know how to be obedient to what he has called me to do uh, to his leading uh, to the ministry that he's made possible for me in the world so I'd say those are two of the, the core pieces for me yeah and so you said you viewed yourself as like a child of God right yeah and so how would you see how do you perceive God or like what do you see him as or a better question is how do you picture him 
Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, you know, honestly, I'm not sure that's one I have a very good answer to. Uh, certainly, um, no less than Jesus taught us that when we were to pray, we were to call him Abba, Daddy, Father. Uh, and so there is a component to that. One of the most common uh, metaphors for salvation in the New Testament is adoption. That God has, uh, in a, if not a literal way, uh, something close to that, adopted us into his family. He has shared his identity with us. Um, so there is part of me that does relate to God that way as a parent. Um, but, you know, I try to be careful... Um, I try to be careful to, to, to not hold my, my picture of God very tightly in the sense that I recognize that if God is who I think he is, uh, then, he's, then he is in many ways beyond my ability to grasp him. Uh, and almost every time I think I, I try to fit him into some, some accessible little picture, uh, I unavoidably leave out significant parts of who he is. Um, so this is something I would just call theological imagination. And I think, honestly, we have too little of it. Um, that, that too often um, what we do is we have, a, we have an idea about God or we grasp something and, and we immediately want to reduce him to that. Um, and I think in the same way that, you know, I, I have an 8-year-old and 6-year-old daughter. And if, if, they, if they can't think of me as anything but a father and they, they don't understand that I am also a husband to my wife... Uh, they are missing out on a very essential component of who I am. Um, and so, I don't know, I, I think I try to hold that a little bit loosely. I also try to recognize that even though God has revealed a lot about who he is to us in Scripture, he's under no uh, pressure to reveal all of who he is to us. Uh, that even if we were able to somehow lay hold of everything that he communicated to us, there, there, there most likely is still much more that we just don't know and maybe even can't know. Um, so to me, God is God, and there's none like him. And almost everything we say about him, almost every way we understand him, is uh, by metaphor and analogy. That's the best we can do. Um, and that's okay. That can give us a good picture. Um, but I try not to be under any illusion that I somehow have the best picture or the only picture. Yeah, those are some very good points. Um, so how would you uh, view, like, afterlife or heaven is it different for evangelicals or <laughs> uh, i don't think so um i think we're all headed the same place um although i would i would add that the th oh, this is one area i'll just take my opportunity here um i think we've gotten into the popular conception that um we, we are that what we look forward to is some sort of disembodied afterlife in some different place um Stephen Colbert once said uh, his picture of heaven, I mean, that's a joke, but he said his picture of heaven is he's floating on a cloud with a harp in one hand and a mint julep in the other hand talking to Ronald Reagan. Um, and, <laughs> I mean, as much as that's a joke, I think there are a lot of images from that that are in the popular conception when the future hope, specifically, that Christianity holds out is actually a physical resurrection, uh, that there will be a time when we are outside of our physical bodies um, but that ultimately what we look forward to is not an existence somewhere else, uh, but a being raised back to physical life uh, in a physical world. A new, a, a world that's been made new, been renewed um, by the same God who created it in the first place. Uh, so I think that's very important, uh, what we look forward to, but what all Christians look forward to, Catholic, Lutheran, and Evangelical, uh, is resurrection, um, not simply eternal life. Um, in fact, I'll give you my quick little analogy. So if you think about your cell phone and what it is that makes it your phone, it's two things, right? It's hardware and it's software, which that's just a shorthand for all your stuff, right? Your contacts, your apps. Um, if, I, if, if you had a, uh, a Galaxy S8, if I just took that from you and gave you a different S8, you'd say, hey, give me my phone back. And I'd say, well, that is your phone. It's a Galaxy S8. And you'd say, well, it's the same kind of phone, but it doesn't have my stuff on it. It's missing my software, right? Um, in the same way that if I took your S8 and I gave you, let's say, an S4, you'd say, whoa, whoa, whoa give me the S8 back. This phone is ancient. I'd say, well, that's, that is your phone. It has all your stuff on it. You'd say, no, it's just my stuff. It's you're missing the physical phone. 
um, I'd, I'd say human beings are irreducibly um, two components. We are a, a physical component and a non-physical component, whatever you want to call that, a soul, a spirit, um, and that to be us is to be both of those things at once. Um, I do think there's a period after death where, you know, again, it's only an analogy, they all fail somewhere, but where when our hardware fails, uh, we go live on God's hardware. So you can think of that as maybe your stuff is safe up in the cloud. But the, ultimately what we look forward to is not being in the cloud. We look forward to the day when God will give us new and better hardware. And our, we will be, if you will, downloaded into new hardware. Uh, that's what we look forward to. It's still us. It's all our stuff. You know, our soul, the essence of who we are. Uh, but just this time, um, in a body that is material, uh, still matter. It's just non-corruptible. It won't break down. That's actually a really good perspective. Yeah, so um, that's like, those are, would you say those are like your ideas of salvation or being saved too, just like the physical reincarnation? Yeah, yeah, so um, I would say that is in a way, um, I would still say that's, that's our future hope. Salvation, I would say, is a little bit different than that. That's one of the benefits of salvation. Um, salvation, salvation also is um, almost a, on a... On a different level um it's salvation i mean salvation means to be saved it's being saved from um slavery to sin that's probably the best way that i can put that um, and i think this is a concept i think everyone can identify with uh ever every human being i've ever talked to wrestles with the fact that it seems to be the case that none of us can all the time do what we prefer to do um you know just the other day uh, i got frustrated with my kids and and immediately thought, why did I just get, it was, it was not a big deal, why did I respond that way? Um, and so right after I kind of got frustrated, I immediately apologized, but I just feel like, why can't, <laughs> why can't I figure that out, you know, 15 seconds earlier? Um, so part of what, what evangelicals, I think Christians in general would say, is that that is part of a, a slavery to sin that we have. Um, and so that, that speaks to the fact that we, we simply aren't able to be the kind of people we would like to be, and, and that there are some very real consequences for sin. Um, so we are saved from that. We are saved from slavery to sin and slavery to evil. Um, and with that, the Bible teaches that, that death is the consequence of sin. Uh, and so it's not that we're saved simply from death. We're saved from sin, and because of that, uh, we escape its consequences, which is death. Uh, we are saved to uh, resurrection. I don't know if that was helpful or not, but uh, yeah, that's that's a good run at it anyway. All right. So, final question. Yeah. So, uh, what are your thoughts about like the existence of evil, or like where does it come from? How does, how does it come up if God is here? Yeah. That's a good question and a very old question. Um, I'll maybe start with something like a caveat, which is that um, that is a the problem of evil is something that has plagued um, what we popularly call the Western mind for a very long time. Uh, but what's one of the things that's really fascinating to me about the Bible is that nobody in the Bible really seems to ask that question. Uh, they simply take for granted that evil exists. Um, and their, their problem of evil, if you will, isn't why is there evil? Uh, their, their problem of evil is, is something more like why is it that the wicked prosper uh, and the righteous sometimes suffer? Uh, they feel like if there's a just God who's in control of the world, then it should always be the case that it's the wicked who are punished and the righteous who are rewarded. Um, but however you look at it, um, I guess I would... Go, I would I would rather stand in line with the biblical tradition, and I would say that we maybe need one more category. Um, so when I when I read Genesis, for example, um, instead of good and evil, I think it's easier to think in terms of there is order, there is non-order, and there is disorder. Uh, disorder would be close to what we would call evil today, uh, in that it is sort of the active disruption of order, but. There's also non-order. Uh, there's, there's things that simply aren't ordered yet. They're not evil in and of themselves. Um, this is something like the ancient view of 
of the oceans, for example, there's chaos, there's non-order, uh, but there isn't necessarily active evil. Um, so I guess I would say what I see in Genesis 1 is that God has created human beings to be partners in his, in his project of bringing order to all creation. Um, and of course, from the biblical perspective, part of right order uh, is a right orientation to God, recognizing that he is above us, that we owe him our allegiance and obedience, um, and also recognizing uh, our right relationship with one another, that we are to respect all people as created in the image of God, bearing the dignity of their creator, uh, and that they're to be loved and cared for, that we're to reflect God's love and goodness outward to each other, but also into the rest of creation. Um, so non-order, non-order at least, is always there, but there's a plan for it. Uh, we were part of that plan. Uh, disorder shows up, I would argue, um, when we rejected the work that God called us to. Uh, we said, you know what, we don't need your help, we don't need to be partners with you, we can order things on our own. We tried to make ourselves the center of order. Um, and we ultimately disrupted the good that God had intended for all creation. Um, I guess the short version is, I believe that there is evil here. Um, that That's, to me, just common sense observation. Um, but on the other end, what I would say to that is that God isn't happy about that. He's not content to permit it. Uh, and that according to the New Testament, in a very real sense... God was so grieved by the presence of evil within his good creation that he was willing himself to come and lay down his own life so that he might one day put an end forever uh, to all evil and to the consequences that we experience daily. All right. Well, that's all I have for you. Thank you for your time. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh,